Turn your Bibles today, if you could, to John chapter 2, verse 23 through 25. And here's what the Word says. We're going to come back and read some of this a little bit later. So I'm just going to kind of read through it right now, and we're going to get into it. Now when he, he being Jesus, was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. Verse 24. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and had no need, say no need, need. that anyone should testify of man for he knew what was in Man. Now, I've already given it, but I'll give it to you again. The title of today's sermon is The Disease to Please. I've got a question for you because I think we could all really relate to this. Is anyone else outside of your pastor a recovering people pleaser? Come on, anybody? Yeah, yeah anybody? Oh, okay, we're recovering people pleaser. I've learned my lesson over the years um, to, to really know who to please and that God the Father is pleased with me whether or not other people are or not. But y'all know what I'm talking about, right? To where you feel like you have to respond uh, on a timely manner in everybody else's time frame to emails, to texts, you know, to needs, whatever someone's needs are. You can put your, your, your situation there or you don't want anybody disappointed in you. How many of you try to please everybody? You want, you want to, you want to be liked by everybody. Here's the truth behind all of that. We like to be liked. True or false? We, very true, right? We like to be liked. That's why I'm telling you today, people pleasing is a disease. It's a disease. You better watch it. And honestly, we see this in an orphan heart. Orphans want to please people. That's what they do. So you've got to understand, even if you're carrying this orphan heart, this orphan spirit with you, you're probably going to be a people pleaser. But this, this disease that we're talking about today is rooted in insecurity. Okay, so so if you're a people pleaser, you're probably a little insecure in your life and you have a deep need for the approval of other people. You are always looking for the approval of the other people. Now, here's the cool thing. I'm not going to expound on this because we don't have a lot of time uh, today. We've only got like another two hours or so to be able to be here. Uh, But from the outside, honestly, it appears as servanthood. People pleasing will look like servanthood. I'm just serving them. You know, I'm a good Christian. We'll talk about that in a little bit, the difference between being a good Christian and a people pleaser, right? But, but it, it's, it looks like servanthood. Well, I'm, I'm just sacrificing some of these things so that I could serve my brothers and sisters. It's not really servanthood. It's selfish. That's what it is. You go, well, how can it be selfish, pastor, because I'm serving someone else? It's selfish because it causes you, the pleaser, to feel valuable. And if you don't do it, you feel like you don't have value because when you don't please other people, they're mad at you and they start saying things about you or they don't invite you back to their little click club. Come on, somebody, right? Anybody ever knew about a click club? Yeah, they don't invite you back because you didn't, you didn't show up when they wanted you to show up or you didn't answer your phone when they wanted you to answer your phone, but you were doing other things at that point. Right? So what we got to do is we got to identify what's wrong. When you're sick, where do you go? You go to a doctor, right? When you go to the doctor and you wait in the, you know, you have an appointment because everybody has to make an appointment to go to the doctor. So you have to be on time, but the doctor never is. Can I get an amen? Amen. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, So, so you get there at 11 o'clock at about 430 in the afternoon, you finally get to sit down at the table. If there's any doctors in the room, I do have some doctor friends. I love you guys. Uh, uh, but sometimes it's true. Some doctor's offices, it's not. Okay, we, we get it. But you're there, what happens? So the nurse comes in. What does she begin to do? She begins to ask you some questions. What are some of the symptoms that you're having? How long have you had this headache? Do you have a sore throat? Okay, is, is there any family history of this uh, issue in your life? Uh, let me look in your mouth. Yeah, all of these different things. So I just want to ask you a few questions before we get into the meat of the sermon today that may identify if you're a people pleaser or not. Here's one, okay? Are you preoccupied with what others think about you? Okay? 
Let me give you some practical examples because that's, that's what I'm gifted at, just practical examples here, okay? So if you stood in front of the mirror today after you put your clothes on trying to figure out, I wonder if this looks good. I, mean, I don't know. I wonder what you're really doing is not just looking to see if you look good, but you're looking to see if someone else will come up to you and tell you that you look good, right? Come on. Have you ever stood before the mirror? Honey, did I wear this last week? Anybody? Here, I'm, I'm going to give you a revelation. Nobody knows what you wore last week, nor do they care what you wore last week. Come on. Just make sure you don't stink, right? That's, that's kind of what people are thinking. That's it. We don't care what you wear. But if you don't watch it, you're preoccupied with what everybody else is thinking. What about this? Someone sends you a text, and then you start texting back. Anybody ever text back something, and then you hit delete? No, nah, I can't. You want to know why? Because you're preoccupied with what they're going to think about it. You live in the bubble. Y'all know what I'm talking about? You iPhone users? Where's my iPhone users at? Yeah, any other losers in the room? Raise your hand. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Calm down. It's all good. We know that iPhone's the best, but Galaxy 5. Hallelujah. All right. <laughs> but anyway, but if you don't watch it, you live in the bubble. Why? Because you're always worried about what everybody is going to think about a text or a post or whatever it may be. You process everything. Why? Because you're a people pleaser. No, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to say the right things. Well, sometimes we don't need to say the right things. Sometimes it just needs to come out the way that it comes out. And honestly, if you're worried about what to text back, there's a thing called a call button. You can pick up the phone. Most people don't do this these days because you can't hear, te you can, you can't hear tone in a text, right? So, so that's why we're worried because if we got to word this just right because I don't want them to think that I'm saying it a specific way. Well, if you want them to hear you say it, pick up the phone. Make a phone call. Come on. You know, let's bring back the dial for the rotary phones. Can we just bring those back? So that people can be more honest with one another and not worry about what everybody is thinking and process everything in our life, right? Number two, do you have a hard time saying no? Do you have a hard time saying no? If you have a hard time saying no, you're probably a people pleaser. I had a guy one time, and it was when the church began to grow and some things, and I was just getting a few little opportunities. It's not like I'm a big deal or anything. Jesus is a big deal, right? I'm just the guy being used. But this guy pulls me aside, and he says, let me tell you something. From this point in your life, what you say no to is going to be just as important as what you're saying yes to. And I thought to myself, wow, that is, that's a pretty powerful statement. Because a lot of people will pull on you. They'll pull on you, and if you don't watch it, you'll start getting pulled in 15 different directions because of your yes, when what you should be saying yes to is being neglected. That's when you get wrapped up into people play. Well, if I say no, then they won't invite me back. Good. That's that sarcasm that I have in me. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. But it's good. Maybe if they get mad, at, if you got people in your life that'll get mad at you because you don't bend over backwards for them, you don't need them. Okay. I'm trying to speak some life into your life right now. Right? So, so you have to think about that stuff. Here's another question. And I'll, I'll, I'll be done and we'll go back into the scripture. But do you avoid conflict or difficult situations? Because if you avoid conflict or difficult situations, conversations, decisions, whatever that may be, you may be a people pleaser. Because sometimes what you have to do to move forward in life, you've got to have some good old healthy conflict. And there's times that me and my wife, she's sitting on the front row, so I can't lie in front of you today. When she's not here, I lie to you. But when she's here... I've got to tell the truth, right? But there's some times that we sit there. Some of you guests are like, really? He lies when she's not here? No. A bit. Yeah, maybe a little bit. But anyway, but there's times that she understands and I understand that we have to sit down and have some good, healthy conflict to get on the same page. And there's times that she tells me stuff that I don't want to hear. There's times that she looks at me and says, your attitude stinks. And I go, because I'm married to you. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. 
I don't say that, right? I don't say that. I don't say that. But it's like, man, you know, what's the retaliation? What is our response when someone comes and says that? Well, your attitude stinks. Do you see how we do it? Because we don't want to hear those types of things. We don't want to be honest. We don't want someone to be honest with us because if they're honest with us, then we have to change. And we don't like change. Change jacks us up, man. She'll look at me sometimes and goes, when, when's the last time you read your Bible? Come on, laugh. It's not, a, it's not funny, bro. <laughs> when's the last time you read your Bible? Have you been praying? Here's what my wife knows. She knows when I have a specific attitude or I'm stressed out or I'm, I'm really anxious about something. I haven't taken that before God. So I have to have this conflict conversation with her and she has no problem having that conversation with me. And I have no problem having that conversation with her because I'm not just trying to please her and tell her what she wants to hear all the time. I'm telling her what she needs to hear. She's telling me what I need to hear. You know what we need in our life? We need some people in our life that begin to tell us what we need to hear, not just what we want to hear. You need to be a person. In a, if you've got some friends, how many of you got friends in your life? Come on, raise your hand. Wow, we got to get some friends. My gosh, what's wrong with us in this place? But, but look, if you've got a friend in your life, be honest with your friend. Tell that friend, if you're really a friend, tell that friend what they need to hear, not just what they want to hear. Don't be a people pleaser just to keep a friend. Come on. Faithful, what does the Bible say? Faithful are the wounds of a friend. What? Faithful are the wounds. What do you mean? Because friends are always going to be honest. Because they're friends. And sometimes those things wound us. It hurts us. Why? Because we're hearing things that we don't want to hear. In other words, people are not around us to please us. People are around us to help us grow. That's what I want in my life. Let's go back to John 2, 23. And let's look at the life of Jesus, just 23 and 24. And we're going to see how he dealt with this himself. It says this. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at Passover, during the feast, which means there would have been a ton of people in Jerusalem at this time. Okay? This was the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. Jesus got this right from the start. He didn't, ha he didn't have to go back and repent. He got it right from the very beginning, okay? Look at what it says. It says, many believed in his name when they saw the signs, come on, which he did. I saw the sign and it opened up. Okay, if you know that song, you are old with me. Amen. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, but here's what you have to understand, okay? When this happened, the Bible says many believed. Say that with me. Many believed. You know what comes with that? Expectation. You know what comes with that kind of expectation? False expectation. Many now are following. Many now are believing in Jesus, and just like us, Jesus had a, a lot of opportunity right here to become a people pleaser. He had a ton of opportunity. And if you don't watch it, that opportunity comes with expectations that you think you have to meet. Well, I mean, I just now got in this friend group. I've been trying to get in this circle for a year. Golly, what do we live for these days? But man, I just got here. So, so if they ask me to do something, I, I got to get out. I got to do it. But I just joined this little club. And, and if I don't do what the club says, I'm out of the club. Well, peace, chicken grease, I'm out. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you just got to do what you got to do because it's not about pleasing people. It's about pleasing God. So to defeat this disease to please, I'm going to give you about four things. Number one is this. Know your role. Look at your neighbor right now and say it. Say, know your role. Know your role. Come on. Know your role. Know your role. Know your role. Know your role. I was fixing to say something else, but I ain't going to. Know your role. Listen to this. Your purpose determines your priorities. When you know who you are, when you know your role in this earth. Now, I'm talking spiritually now, okay? You've got to know your role spiritually. What does this look like? This life that Pastor Jamie always talks about, what does that look like for me? You've got to know your role. Why? Because your purpose, not people, 
People do not determine your priorities. Your purpose determines your priorities. If you don't know your primary purpose, you won't know what to prioritize in your life. Your priorities are going to be way out of whack. Is there anybody in the room that your priorities have been out of whack before? Right? I don't know about you, but my priorities in life have been out of whack before. There's been moments in my life. I've been in full-time ministry for 18 years. I know I'm only 23. I get it. Right? Did y'all hear that I was told I was going to be a grandfather this past week? What is up with that? Come on. So this is why you've got to know your priorities and what to prioritize. Here's what I know. Number one, I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God, man. Before I'm a husband, before I'm a father, before I'm a pastor, before I'm anybody else, I am a child of God. I've got to obey the voice of God. I've got to listen to God. Jill knows if there's anybody that has priority over her in my life, it's Jesus. It's Jesus, man. If I know there's anybody that has priority in her life over me, it's Jesus Christ. I'm a child of God first. I am a husband second to that beautiful young lady that is sitting on that front row right there. I am her husband second. That is prioritizing. Now, I will go ahead and tell you, I haven't always had this together. I'm giving you my example. What are your priorities, right? I'm a father third. I am a father third. If you've noticed, I ain't even talked about the call of God on my life yet. I ain't even talked about it. Why? Because it's on down the list. God's called me to be a husband to that beautiful lady that's sitting on the front row. God called me to be the father and now grandfather. Come on, somebody. To these children that he has put in my life. I've got to prioritize those people. And if I put my call in there, my pastorate, my pastoring is probably fourth, if not fifth, in my life. But for 12 years of the 18, and maybe even 13 or 14 of the 18 years, and I'm still working on it, do you know that I prioritize my life totally different than what I just spelled out to you? What shook me is one day I was at an eighth grade, or, or my wife and my oldest daughter, the one that's now fixing to have the child, she's 23 and lives in uh, Oklahoma City. But uh, when she was at her eighth grade volleyball night, there was a guy in church. He actually cussed at me. It was hilarious. I was sitting in the office at church on eighth grade night. You know the night when the parents are supposed to walk the child down to midcourt and you give them a rose and all of that kind of stuff? Yeah, I had something going on at church, which I was actually at church by myself in my office doing nothing, just busy work, nothing. And I got a text message from a congregant, and he cussed me out almost. And here's what he said. He sends a picture of Jill and Kaylee mid-court and says, what in the <clears throat> can be more important than this? What can be more important? What, what is more important than this? You tell me. I don't care. Are you at a funeral home? Are you at a wedding? What, what, what can actually be more important than this? And that's what this guy, he just laid it out there. I hit my knees, man. I hit my knees. I started bawling. I was crying. Now, did I get up and go to that place? No, I was embarrassed. I was ashamed. It probably took me a couple years to really get in my head that, okay, I don't have to please people to be a pastor. It took me a while. Honestly, she was probably out of school. She's been out of school for six years. She was probably out of school, and my other daughter was almost fixing to graduate before I really got it in my head that I am here to please God, not people. And I'm only telling you that not to say, hey, look at me, and this is my role as a pastor, but I think the mandates that people put on our lives, we don't see in the Bible. And we're, we're always living to please people, but not God. And the mandates that God does put in the Bible, we don't do. Why? Because we're always trying to please people. There have been times that I've had to disappoint people to prioritize the right things. And there's going to be times in your life that you're going to have to disappoint people to begin to prioritize the right things. 
And we see that in the life of Christ. John chapter 2, verse 24. Listen to what it says. It says, but Jesus did not commit himself to them. Now, that's kind of crazy. This is Jesus. This is the Son of God. I mean, come on. Here's many's believing in him. They're following him. But you know what? He, he couldn't commit himself to all of those people. And the Greek word for uh, commit there is pistuo. I hope I'm saying that right, but I think it is. It's pistuo, right? It means to credit or to place confidence in. And here's what Jesus was saying. He was not placing his confidence in man. He wasn't doing that. He couldn't do that. He wasn't placing his confidence in them. Why? Because he was the reason, or man was the reason that he was showing up to have to die on the cross. He knew what was in man. He didn't have to to have man to testify about who he was. Why? Because he knew his role. He knew who he was. Do you know your role? Do you have to have four or five people to confirm that you're a good person, that you'd uh, uh, give the shirt off of your back to anybody? Do you have to have people say that to believe who you really are in Christ Jesus? See, because when you live to please people, right, disease to please, what happens? You've misplaced your confidence. Now your confidence is in someone else. It's not really in the God that you serve. You can't misplace your confidence, okay? Number two, you got to know who to fear. you got to know who to fear. This is a big one. It's, it's probably going to be my shortest point. But this is a really big one. You've got to know who to fear. Pull up Proverbs 29, I believe it is. The fear of man brings a snare. It's a trap. When you begin to fear man, it's just a trap in our lives. But whoever trusts in and puts confidence in the Lord will be what? Exalted and safe. So where's your confidence at? Where are you putting your trust? And if we got really real today, we would say this, we've become more fearful of man than we are of God. You see it even in the local church, the culture that we live in today. Some people are tiptoeing around on what they say, what they can say, what they can't say. Lock me up, Jack. Do whatever you have to do. If the Bible says something and some type of sin is coming against what the Bible says, I'm preaching the Bible. I'm going to love the person all the way through it, but my gosh, we can't water down the gospel so people feel comfortable. Are you with me today? Yeah. We can't be fearful of man and not fearful of what God says. And when we say fearful of what God says, I'm not talking about in some, ooh, but in a reverence way, very reverent Oh, God, your word says I have to abide by your word, which takes me to the third point. You got to know who to please. You got to know who to please. I love what Paul is, is teaching uh, the church in Thessalonica, and he's writing this letter in 1 Thessalonians, and as he says this here in chapter 2, verse 4, I would ask you, I always leave verses out because I want you to go back and read them for yourself to make sure your pastor is in context and what he is saying. Go back and read verses 1 through 3, and you'll see the context of this. But listen, it says, but as we have been approved by God, He's talking about the ministers in the Word of God. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God tests our hearts. We're not here to please men. God tests our hearts. You know what was going on? Paul was preaching the truth of the gospel, and people didn't like it. People hated it. He goes back, if you go back and read verse 2, he's talking about how there's a lot of conflict going on in that moment. Why? Because the Word of God is being preached and people don't like it. Who are we trying to please? Are we trying to please God or are we trying to please man? I love what he says in Galatians. Same guys, writing the same thing, writing to another church in Galatia. Here's what he says in chapter 1, verse 10. For, I, for do I now persuade men or God? Which one? Do I seek to please man? He goes on and he says, For if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Amen. That's a whole nother level, church. If we seek to, to please man in our life and not God, are we really bondservants to Christ? 
Another word uh, for a bond servant there is a slave. And that word slave has such a negative connotation in today's culture. But what that means is whatever God says we do. Am I, am I a slave to God when I'm trying to please man? Well, no, you can't. You can't live on this side of the fence and that side of the fence. You're either all in with God or you're not. You can't straddle the fence. See, we live in a culture, a church culture today that says, I'll oh, just straddle the fence. As long as you show up, hey, if you'll show up and give to the church and be involved in a C group and serve, we don't care. Just do whatever you want to do because that's what success looks like in the local church. My gosh, where have we missed it? Because pleasing God often means disappointing people. Can I say that one again? Pleasing God often means disappointing people. What do you mean? Learn to say no. Learn to say no. I had someone after the last service, they said, do you know that I was taught that no is a full sentence? I said, now that's good right there. No is a full sentence. Some of us, when we're faced with different situations or whatever, or somebody's trying to pull on us, and it's going to take us away from the things that God has positioned us in or put in our lives, you know what we need to say? No. Oh, that was weak. You know what we need to say? No. That's it. Come on. Some of us, we need to learn to do something, right? And it's this four-letter S word, and it's kind of a cuss word, but I'm going to say it. Y'all know? Okay. I know that y'all are probably thinking, oh my gosh, is he really going to say this? Yes, it's a cuss word, but I'm going to say it. Okay, you got to learn to stop. Stop, S-T-O-P. I don't know what word you were thinking, but you've got to learn to stop. And sometimes that's a cuss word in our vocabulary. We can't stop. Why? Because we're people pleasing. I can't stop. I can't stop. Pastor Jamie, I can't stop. Who said you can't stop? You can stop. And sometimes you just got to go, whoa. I'm done, man. Hey, I got to reevaluate, man. I, I don't know if my priorities are lining up with my purpose. I don't know if this is exactly what I need to be doing. I know that I committed to some of this and I repent. I am so sorry, but I got to stop here because I don't know if this is the will of God in my life. Well, you said, well, I understand what I said, but I think I may be getting to the point where I have to say no because there's only one person that I'm going to live to please and that's my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I have to live to please that guy. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13. This is a, a good text. It says this. It says, all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Why? What, 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 what do you mean? There's only one that I'm living to please. Man, there, that guy right there, Hebrews. Pull that back up just real quick. Pull, pull that one up. All things are naked and open to the eyes of him. So you know what? I don't care what you look like today. I don't care how prepared you are. I don't care if you say that you're a people pleaser or if you don't say that you're a people pleaser. Maybe you're deceived. I have no idea. But here's what I do know. All things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. When I stand before God, I will not be able to bring all those people that I pleased in front of God and go, but God, 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 I understand. I understand. But man, these are your children and I was trying my best. He don't care about that. He does not care about that. And one day we're going to stand before God at the judgment seat of Christ and we're going to give an account. And we're going to have to answer for what we've done here on this earth, right? It takes us to number four. It's, it's this, and Kenzie, whoever can, can go ahead and come on out. But know whose approval matters. Know whose approval matters. Do y'all remember this is week five? Let's go back four weeks prior to today and let's, let's talk about that first sermon. I think the title of that sermon is Who Am I? Who Am I? Just identifying who I am. Do y'all remember that one? Whether you were an orphan or a slave, y'all remember that? or a son or a daughter. Who am I, right? And one of the scriptures that I brought out was Matthew 3, 17. Y'all remember that one? Before Jesus ever performed a miracle, before he ever started his ministry, he was baptized by, by John, and the Bible says the heavens open, a dove or, or the Holy Spirit in form of a dove came, fell on uh, uh, Jesus, and God's voice spoke from heaven and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. 
So before you do anything, when you confess Christ over your life, when you begin to live for God, you've got to know no matter who wants to pull on you, God's approval is what matters. And when he looks at you, he looks at you and says, this is my beloved son, or this is my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased. Before you ever serve on a team, before you ever do any of the stuff that church culture says to do, which I think is great to do, but we can't put that as a God in our life. You got to know whose approval matters. Does the Father's approval matter more than the people's approval in your life? That's the question. And easily it comes out of our mouth, yes. But really? Because if it comes out of your mouth, and, and some of you, you may have said yes, and you are doing it, man. But yes is just a word. Actions speak louder than words. And so your actions, does your actions back up your yes? Let me ask it like this. Do they, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, mean more than them, everybody else in your life? Do they mean more than them? I love John chapter 12. If you would, flip, flip on over to John chapter 12 just real quick. John chapter 12, just, just real quick. Verse 42 and 43, nevertheless, even among the rulers. Now, let's break this down just for a minute. Y'all don't read it before I read it, okay? Because it kind of gives itself away there. Nevertheless, even among the rulers, this, this, in today's culture, it would be like this. Uh, your councilmen, uh, your governors, your senators, uh, senators, uh, which may be a senator, I'm not really for sure, but your senators, your president, you know, all those types of things. That would have been rulers, okay? It's not just talking about rulers in the church. We're going to talk about those people in a minute. But nevertheless, listen, even among the rulers, many believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him. Now, now hold on a minute, because a lot of us, what we do is we go, oh, well, yeah, yeah, that, wow, I can't believe that. But how many of us are living in the same thing? We believe in him, but because everybody else around us, we can't confess him. We could, but because it may not be pleasing to those people, come on, we wouldn't want to. We feel like that we can't, man, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. Today's terms would be like this. You know what? These people, they believed in Jesus, but because of church folk, they couldn't confess him. Leadership in the church, they couldn't confess them because they wouldn't be able to come back to church. They'd tell them, no, you can't come back to church. Why? Because you're believing in this whole Messiah thing. You're believing in this old Jesus movement stuff. I, I just don't know. That's, that's not how we believe. We believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Even though in the Old Testament it had been prophesied that Jesus was coming. And the very Messiah that they had been teaching out of their Old Testament scrolls is right in front of them. But here they are just sitting in pushing people out of the, the local church, the synagogue in that day. Crazy, man. Absolutely crazy. Verse 43. But listen to this. This is the powerful moment. For they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. See, there's this fine line between being a good Christian and being a people pleaser. There's this fine line, huge fine line. Am I, am I going to be a good Christian or am I going to be a people pleaser? Fine line. Would you agree? Because sometimes it's like, man, I, I think it's a good Christian to go over here and do these things. Yeah, that's right. If you're not neglecting the things that God's called you to do. I sat after the first service with a, with a gentleman that was a plumber with tears running down his face. And he's just sitting there going, man, I put everything in front of my family. Everything. The person that he's with, she's sitting there, she's going, yeah, 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 yeah. And I think sometimes what we do is, is we think, well, we, we've got to, honey, I hope you understand, but i got to work some overtime so that we can have retirement. Really? What if you don't make it to retirement age? What if you take a stand, and I've seen this happen time and time again, even in the workplace, what if you took a stand and said, you know what, here's my morals, here's my values, and here's my time that I'm going to need with God. And if you don't give me that, then I'll go somewhere else. I've seen people take a stand like that and get fired. I have. 
I've seen people take a stand like that and, and their boss is respectful of that and goes, wow, hey, can you come into my office and tell me a little bit of why you're so passionate about this God that you serve? I've seen it both sides. But I don't want to stand before God one day and God say, hey man, uh, you know that $17.50 an hour that you were scared to sacrifice because you wouldn't stand up for me because you were scared you were going to lose your job? Come on, man. Did you not think that I wasn't more than $17.50 an hour? Because the truth is, if you would have stood up, you would have got fired. I had a $27.50 an hour job waiting on you, but you never received that because you wouldn't stand up for me. See, there's a fine line between being a good Christian, a good person, and being a people pleaser. And you know what we need? We need the Holy Spirit to teach us the difference. Because Jamie could try his best. Yeah, go ahead. I could try my best, church to get you to the point to where you think maybe Jamie's explained this enough where now I know the difference. No, no, I, I think that we need the Holy Spirit to come into our lives and teach us the difference. Do you have the disease to please? I've got to read this because Psalm chapter 118, they don't have this. Write this down in your notes. Somebody else, I love it when people come and, and just give me little snippets to my sermon. But Psalm chapter 118, if he's watching online right now, he was in the second service. Psalm 118.8. This is funny because this scripture is centric in the Bible. It is the very central of the Bible. Let's say the Bible has 20,000 scriptures, okay? I should know how many. This is 10,000. This is very central of the Bible. And you know what Psalm 118.8 says? center of your Bible. You ready? It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. I think it's time to turn to God. Let's put our confidence, our hope, our time, our energy, our effort into Jesus, not just man. Let's serve man, but let's serve God first. Amen. Let me pray for you. Father, uh, I just know, I know without a shadow of a doubt, you've laid this sermon on my heart. And there's some of us, we don't know our role. Some of us, we may not know who to fear. We don't know who to please. We don't really know what matters. But God, I know that through revelation, through your Holy Spirit, that you can reveal that to us today. If there's anybody in here and they're confused, I pray, God, that you will allow your spirit, your word, the things that you have in store for us to be made evident. Just like I said in the end, I can't give all the words that people need. Holy Spirit, would you teach us what we need to know in this situation? Maybe you're here today and you just say, hey man, you know what, for me, I have been so far away from my purpose that I've, been, I've, I've just been disobeying God I feel like, Pastor Jamie, I'm a good person. I feel like I do good deeds. I, I do fall into that trap of a people pleaser, but in all honesty, I haven't been performing the will of God in my life. And you know, when that happens in our life, what happens is really we kind of, we get thwarted and, and we get off track and we get to dabbling and doing things that we know we shouldn't do, which kind of takes us a little further from Christ than we should be. And I wonder if today is a day of repentance for you. A turning, a turning point in your life to begin to identify the role that you play, the role that God has just for you, not for the group you're in, for you, so that you be can begin to be that obedient follower of Jesus Christ. If that's you today and you need to make that shift, you need to make that turn, Nobody's looking around. Slip up your hand. Let me pray for you just real quick. Slip up your hand. Slip up your hand. Yeah, several people. Yeah, yeah. Hallelujah. Absolutely. I see you up there. Let me pray with you just for a minute. Say, Jesus, in this moment, I've realized that I'm a people pleaser. That I've done things for others while neglecting doing things for you. And I repent of that. I repent of my disobedience. I repent of any sin that I may have in my life. 
and I turn everything over to you right now. Just use me. Mold me and make me into your image. Thank you for your purpose. Thank you for your call. And most of all, thank you for your forgiveness. In Jesus' name, amen.